We're going to go right into Scripture today, uh, into our, our uh, lesson, and we're going to be in Genesis chapter 6. If you want to turn your Bible there, and we're going to kind of bounce around a little bit, but I, I want to thank Pastor Bill again for bringing us the message last week of Genesis chapter 4. Um, and before I, I really dive into Genesis chapter 6, I just want to, well that pen don't want to be in there. We're just going to get it going. What do you think of that? All right. So anyway, in Genesis chapter 5, it starts off in verse 1 that this is the book of genealogies. And it starts to give us great information. I don't, because we're skipping it in the message, I don't want you to think that book's not important because it is. There's great information in Genesis chapter 5. It talks about genealogies that come into place, but it also gives us an understanding of the lifespan of man as God created him. Remember, Genesis chapter 1, God created everything and it was good. In Genesis chapter 2, he talks about man and woman being created specifically, and God says it was very good. And then in Genesis chapter 3, we see the fall takes place. That here comes the temptation. We know the devil has fallen at that point. He tempts Eve and Adam. There's temptation. There's an acceptance of temptation. Sin enters the world. We have the fall of man. All that comes in place. There's judgment that comes into place. God says because of what's happened here, women are going to have challenges or more pain when we have childbirth. It says men are going to work for each and everything they have. For their own food, they're going to have to work the ground. The serpent himself was going to have to go on his belly. There was judgment that was passed. But even in all of that, we see in Genesis 3 and verse 15 that there was grace. God says, He talks to the serpent, and He says that He is going to put an enmity, that means a division, between the seed of woman and the seed of Satan. And He says that that seed, that offspring that's going to come, the, the children of woman are going to, to bruise the head of Satan, but He's going to keep biting at their heels. We see that analogy, and we understand it points to Jesus Christ. That even though Satan tries to attack woman in every way to make sure that the Son of God cannot be born, that it is through the very birth of a Messiah, through woman, that we're going to have our chance at redemption. So we see all of those things, they come into play. Now, in chapter 5, as men were created, what I want you to see, if you were to read through this, and that's part of your homework, that's one homework assignment. I want you to see the ages. Some of you talk about, oh, you don't know nothing yet. I'm 45, getting ready to turn 46, and y'all like to tell me, oh, boy, you don't know nothing yet. This is going to fall off. This is going to happen. That's going to hurt. You know, you know, you tell me all of these different things. You say, boy, you don't know nothing yet. All I can say, were you 969 years old? Because in the day of Genesis chapter 5, we see ages. We see the <laughs> oldest recorded life in history, the biblical history. It is a man named Methuselah. And it says he was 969 years old when he died. Now, many people like to say, well, that age was different. You know, there's this, that. I'm not going to get into that junk. The Bible says this is how old they were, and I'm going to take the Bible as it states. And so we see these things. Another thing you see in Genesis chapter 5 is a man named Enoch walked with God so well. He was not perfect, but he had a relationship with God so good that he didn't <coughs> die. God just took him home. I want you to see that. He was about 300 years old. And there's so many lessons we can get from this. We see some men were, were very old when, when they passed, and we see like Enoch, he was taken home early. That we don't understand God's plan, but God has one, and He always knows what's best. Amen? So I want you to see these things, and understand in chapter 5, we have all, think of this, how many children could you have in 969 years? Your children will be happy. You will have great, 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 great grandchildren before you pass. Why, you're still having children. I mean, we look at that biblical account of things going on. What I want you to see is there is a setup for exactly what God called man and woman to do to be fruitful and multiply. And that leads us to Genesis chapter 6. Would you stand and read with me as we read the Word of God? We're going to read verses 1 through 8 of Genesis chapter 6. This will wake you up, and it's to honor God as we read His Word. 
And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that He had made man on the earth, and He grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Isn't it wonderful that even in sin and judgment there is always grace? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for the Word today. And God, I just ask You to speak through me. Use me, God, the way You want, uh, you want me to be used. May the words You want spoken today be spoken. May the message You want preached today be preached. And God, allow Your Holy Spirit just to reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And God, would You bring to remembrance through Your Spirit the words that are in Your Scripture, and may it have a, a deeper meaning wherever we are in life. Encourage us, God. Convict us but draw us closer to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Now, let's see how many of you will be honest with me. Raise your hand if you have watched The Young and the Restless. All right? So I got some honest people in here. Some of you were like, some of you men were like, I don't want nobody to know. You know, I used to laugh at folks. I used to go see, I'm going to pick on her. She's going to get me for it. I used to go play with and Miss Now, she could never watch The Young and the Restless when they came on, but they always came on later in that afternoon, and she could catch them like at 4.30 in the afternoon when we'd be home from school. Um, but we would go in there, and, and I just remember thinking to myself, my mother used to love to watch them. You know, pe people would love to watch all of those soap operas, you know, that when they were something. I said, I can't believe that. Then I got hired at the fire department. And I will tell you what, the world had to stop at 1130 because we had to get our, our small chicken bag white meat and, uh, from Parker's and we had to get prepared because at 1230 the young and the restless came on. <laughs> it was like calls are coming in. Like, I don't want to go on a call. It's right now. Victor's done this. The thing about the soap operas is you could miss a couple of days and come back, and you were right there where you were. You know, you could pick it up quickly. I just, uh, I don't know, it's about a year or so ago, you know, there's only, I think, one left, The Young and the Restless, or two left that's even on TV. And I watched about five minutes of it, and although none of the players were the same except Victor <laughs> that I saw, I picked it up just like It took like five minutes, and I knew this person was here, and this is going on, and that. Where am I going with it? If you think that's good in looking at drama, seeing conspiracy take place, to see this person plotting on that person, to see good and evil, just get in your Word. Everything you want to see is right there. In fact, we're going to look at that today in Genesis chapter 6. So it came to pass, I want you to see, there's mass population taken in the early earth. It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. And then we get into verse 2 that gets controversial. It says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, and they were fair. Now, let's just stop there for a minute. If you read through this quickly, you just say, well, yeah, you know, there's, there's guys, saw girls, they thought they looked good. It's kind of like today. We still have that kind of thing going on, right? But I want you to understand here that, that we, need to, we need to drill down just a little bit further to set up a full understanding of what God is doing in Genesis 6. He says, The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. Something about this God didn't like. And He tells us that in verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. Something bothered Him. What was it? 
May I just get you to think for a minute here that the sons of God were not just men. That the sons of God were some other being, whether it be angelic or whether it, it be some other form that God made. Now, there's, there's going to be two lines on this. If you really dive in and you look, some, some will say, well, it couldn't be angels. And there's a, there's a scripture in, in Matthew chapter 22 where Jesus is asked about the resurrection. Who will you be married to if, if, uh, if your wife had died and you remarried and she died and you remarried again? Which wife will you have in heaven? You know, that's an important question. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 22, He says, you, you guys, you, you're missing the whole boat. You're not married in heaven is what He says. And He's talking about the resurrection itself. And there's a reference in there and He says, uh, you're, uh, he, he talks about angels. And there's a reference that, well, angels are forbidden to marry. I want you to look at something with me, and it's important, that we see the sons of God were something different than man and woman. All right? The sons of God. I want you to think for a minute of, again, being some type of angelic, a cherubim, or, or something. And I'm going to show you some scripture that will... will We'll put it into context as we look at it. In fact, if you would, go with me to the book of Job. Job is just before Psalms. If you'll go with me in the book of Job, chapter 1, I want us to look at just a couple of Scriptures here. We see the exact same wording in Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. So we get this setting that there is God, and that the sons of God come present, and there's also Satan that's present. Well, where's that at? We don't know exactly where it is, but we know where it's not by the next verse. Read along with me, verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down it. So we know they're not at the earth, because God asked Satan, Hey, where have you been? And Satan said, I've been walking all over the earth. If you go to Job chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, we see the exact same account again. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. So I want you to see there is the sons of God, whatever they are, and there is Satan that had to come before the Lord. Now go with me to Job chapter uh, 38. Job chapter 38, just to give us a little bit more understanding. In the context of Scripture, I'll try not to use but a couple more minutes here. For the context of Scripture, we know Job's been tempted. He's lost everything. He's lost his family. He's lost his possession. He had health issues. He had boils all over his skin. I mean, he just, he just, his wife told him to curse God and die. He had the worst that could ever be. And, and God is showing something through this faithful servant. And he says in these first couple of verses in chapter 38, he's saying, look, all right, it's time for you to get out of your pity party. Stand up and listen to what I'm saying to you is what he's saying. So read along with me. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, chapter 38, verse 1, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. And God starts to ask questions to Job. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? He said, Job, where were you at when I created? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof if thou knowest? Were you there when I created things? Or I have stretched a line upon it. Wherein are the foundations therein fastened? Do you know how I created things? He's asking Job all of these questions. And then he goes in verse 7. When the morning stars sang together... And all the sons of God shouted for joy. God's making a reference here to Job. He's saying, you were not there, Job, when I created everything. But who do we see in the reference was there when God created everything? The sons of God. I want you to see this, that there is something that God had created and were created for good, whether they be angels, seraphim, cherubim, archangels, angelic beings, something that was different, that was with God in creation. We see this from the text. In the Septuagint, 
which is the first Hebrew Bible. Let me just put it to you this way. People way smarter than us in a study of, of ancient uh, scripture, ancient scrolls that came up with the first Hebrew Bible translated the, the verbiage used here to angels. All right? So, so I want you to get this picture. Now some of you are thinking, the preacher is going crazy today. All right? Stick with me. I want you to see the truth of God's Word. And, and, and there's, a, there's a realism here we've got to understand as we continue. If we were to go to the book of Daniel chapter 3, verse 25, um, you, you can learn, uh, you can turn, or you can look up on the screen of that. Daniel chapter 3, verse 25. We, we have the three amigos have been thrown into the fiery pit. All right. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego won't bow down and worship the false gods. So the king's been tricked. He has to throw them into the fiery furnace. And as the king is looking down in this fiery furnace, which had consumed everything, even the first two guards, it was so hot. When he looks down, he says this. He says, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose. His question was, didn't we just throw three in? I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Same translation when we look at this. You know, many times people say they think that was actually the Christ that was in there. What we know for sure is God sent one of His protectors that protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All right? So, what are we talking about in Genesis chapter 6, verse 2? At the very least, I want you to understand this. They are something that is following Satan. All right? I personally believe, from the context of Scripture, that they're fallen angels that Satan has used in an attack against man. Now, go back to this with me. In Genesis chapter 3, and, and I'm sorry, y'all, this is interesting to me. Y'all with me here? Are y'all good? In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, after the fall of man and the judgment comes, God says, He gives hope, He gives grace. He says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that, that there's going to be this enmity between the sons of woman and the sons of Satan. He's talking to the devil. There's going to be this division. And he says in that verse that the son of woman is going to stomp your head, devil, and you're going to constantly be attacking. Now, many times we give the devil as much knowledge and credit as we give God. And let me tell you, that's wrong. He is not God. He does not have the attributes of God. He doesn't know what God knows. He is smart and He's clever, but He is not God. And so what He knew from that is God has a plan through the children of woman to take Him out. He doesn't know what it is. But what I see clearly as early as Genesis 6, the devil has his third of fallen angels and he has them attack who? The women. They pick women and have children. He's trying to attack the line that God already said would be His deliverance. Now, some of you are thinking the preacher's gone crazy. If that's the case, I really am crazy, but I think I'm spot on when it comes to the Word of God. All right? What does this all mean? A couple of other scriptures, and I, I've got to move on for time. Go with me to the book of Jude. I would tell you uh, jokingly to turn to Jude chapter 6, but uh, some of you would have trouble finding that. Jude doesn't have chapters. It just has verses. In Jude verse 6 and Jude verse 7, it says this. This is talking um, about angels leaving what they were designed to do. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner given themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. It's saying that God has taken those angels that left their original estate of where they were supposed to be, and he's already put them somewhere. He's chained them up until eternal judgment comes. It's not all the angels, but it's the specific ones he was talking about. If you go with me to 1 Peter, go with me if you don't mind to 1 Peter. We'll look at just a few verses. In 1 Peter chapter 3, 
Y'all tell me when you've seen the young and the restless get this interesting. I'm just telling you. All right? In 1 Peter chapter 3, look at verse 19 and 20 with me. This is speaking just before verse 19. There's a reference to Jesus being put to death on the cross. And this is what it says in verse 19. By which also he went, speaking of Jesus, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Did you get that tie in? Yeah, it's right there in the New Testament, speaking back again in connection. We see that this is the case. So, go back with me. Genesis chapter 3. Let's get on, on text. Why is it important? Let me throw one other reference out there. Some of you have got Bibles in which I told you to get life application Bibles. They're great. They are super. Man, they're so super. But they're going to tell you if you look up this particular reference of the Son of God, and, and there's other theology that would do the same, that this could not have been angels, that it was probably men from the line of Seth which married women uh, from the line of, or men from the line of Cain which married women from the line of Seth, and caused something that wasn't supposed to happen in that time. Either way, no matter which way you go, get this. Satan and his followers tempted with sin in front of those that were living in the earth and the world, and they bit. Sin was rapid. How do we know sin was rapid? Let's continue in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. There were giants in the earth those days, and also after that when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and some became mighty men which were of old men of renown. What I want you to see is when the sons of God took the children of men and they married and had children, there was something about these children that just stood out. When it says renown, what it was saying mighty and renown is it just made an impression. You know, you get to make two impressions. You can make a really good impression or you can make a really bad impression, right? Think about how much time we spend on impressions. You know, I, I, how long do you men folk have to sit in front of the mirror before you're able to leave and, and go out? I'm sure it's for hours, right? You know, I'm sure you comb your hair forever before, before it's time to go. You know, anyway, we always worry about making the first impression because it means so much. What I want you to understand when it says men of renown, there was an impression made. Have you ever had that person that makes an impression so good that you say, man, I just like being in their presence. That's a godly man or a godly woman. There's just a peace about them. You know what I'm talking about? It's just good to be around them. That's a positive impression. Have you ever been in the presence of somebody that your skin just crawls? That it's like, I can't wait to get away. <laughs> Something's wrong. <laughs> you know, the impression that was made here was of a negative impression. Something that, that made them renowned, that made them stand out as we look at it. What did they do? They took wives, they had children. This was against God's plan. How do we know that? Again, because in verse 3 it says God was upset. And then we have in verse 4, I skipped this, but I want to go back. We see judgment start to come. Sin is entered. God is grieved. We have judgment. There were giants, uh, excuse me, the end of verse 3 it says, Yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. This gets interpreted one of two ways. One, God is no longer going to allow man to be 969 years old. He's only going to allow him at the most to be 120. I, I still see where there could be some truth in that. But more especially in this context what we see is that the exact amount of time between when God told Noah to build the ark and when the flood came. See, what I want you to see is God saw sin. It grieved Him, which we'll talk about in just a minute, to the point that He cast judgment. But even when He cast judgment, He still gave 120 years before He brought that judgment. God is a gracious loving God. But God is a just God. God is going to do exactly 
what he says he is going to do. And we see that example in Scripture. Go with me a little bit further if you don't mind. We see in, in verse 5, God saw that the wickedness of man was so great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was on only evil continually. Do you see that? That the heart of man that was living in this time was so wicked that every thought, not most of his thoughts, not a lot of his thoughts, it says that every thought of his heart was wicked continually without stop. It was a wicked generation. You know, when we look at this, we could see some things such as mass population, Genesis 6 1, sexual perversion that takes place, Genesis 6 2, demonic activity, because I do believe no matter what they were, they were followers of Satan. As we see that they took these wives in Genesis 6 5, we see constant evil in the heart of man. And if you would skip down with me in Genesis 11, it says, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. All of these things, you know what I see when I look at these? I look a lot at what we see around us today. Anybody else see that? We see sin enter the world. We see God being grieved and passing judgment. And we see grace all together. Let's go back to verse 6. It says, God saw this, and it repented the Lord that He made man on the earth, and it grieved Him at His heart. God has to repent? What does that mean? The word here literally translated, this word repented, is this. Are you ready for it? It just means a deep sigh. It means a deep breath. Let me ask you this. Have you ever had disappointment hit you so hard that you found yourself without knowing you did it? It's how we're made. It's a reset. Because I'll tell you what's happened. Whatever action took place just before that, has your heart rate pumping? Has you breathing hard? It's a body compensating for shock. Your blood pressure is going up. If you're not careful, your hair is starting to stand up on the back of your neck. And before you even realize it, you don't plan it, but you... <sighs> it's a reset. Usually after some huge grief or disappointment. That's what this word means. And then it says, God was grieved. The literal translation of this word was pained. He was angered. He was hurt. When God sees man in sin, he's repented. He sighs. He's hurt. It's exactly what we see in taking place here. Go with me, just to, to explain a little bit more. Go with me to Matthew chapter 15. I've skipped around a little bit. Matthew chapter 15. Read along with me starting at verse 17. We'll read verse 17 through 20 of Matthew chapter 15. Jesus being asked uh, all kinds of questions, He comes up to this. Do ye, do ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in the mouth goeth into the belly, and is cast into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile the man. Jesus was being asked, why don't your disciples wash their hands? But the context of the Scripture, Jesus is always teaching. He draws them back. He says, I want you to know what makes man bad or what's dirty. It's what comes out of the heart. If you go back in Genesis, we see what was it they were doing in verse 5? The imagination and thoughts of his heart was evil always. So we see God repented. He was grieved. And then if you look in Genesis 6 verse 7, we see judgment come. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created. Judgment. Judgment is real. Judgment is a guarantee. God's Word says it throughout. It's real in every way. I want you to go with me to a few scriptures if you don't mind as we look at judgment. A day of judgment is coming. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 36 through 40, it says this. Matthew chapter 24, starting at verse 36. Jesus speaking. 
But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as in the days of Noah were. What were those days? Mass population, sexual perversion, violence, men doing everything imaginable wicked in their own hearts. As in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. God says there's a day of judgment coming, and people are going to be doing exactly what they were doing at the days of Noah. But you rest assured, judgment is real, and judgment is coming. Jesus said judgment was coming in Genesis 6, and He still gave 120 years. You know, today the New Testament tells us Jesus is coming again. Judgment is coming. Why hasn't He come already? Can this world get any worse? Oh yeah, it's bad, but it can get worse. But just as in the days of Noah, Jesus is going to come like a thief in the night. Judgment is real. Luke chapter 17, verse 26 through 30 says the same thing for time. I'm not going there. Um, but if you would, read along with me in Malachi 4.1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that they that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Though earth, the judgment is coming, and it's going to be judgment by fire. In Romans 2 it says this, verse 5 and 6, after it's talking about God's grace and His mercy, but it's talking about those that won't listen. But after thy hardness and impotent heart treasureth up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds? Judgment day is a sure thing. There's a wonderful picture, if you would go to Revelations with me. We look in Revelation uh, chapter 20. I'm just going to read the last five verses of that. So if you would, Revelation chapter 20, we'll start on, on verse 11. John, sitting in heaven, and this vision is shown to him. He says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. Everybody is going to stand before God. The books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Judgment is real. And judgment is coming. Now, I want us to look we see Genesis chapter 3, temptation. We see sin. We see the fall. We see judgment. But we see God's grace. And we see the same thing again. Go back with me in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, verse 7. The Lord God, this is judgment, said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and the beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And then it says in verse 8, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You know, with all that talking about judgment, does anybody wonder how Noah found grace <laughs> in the eyes of the Lord? Scripture's specific, and it's not by his works. It's not because he built the ark. It's because of his faith that he was chosen to build the ark. In fact, if you would go along with me, um, I want to go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. You'll see it. It comes, it says this, By faith Noah, being warned of God, of the things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. 
What was it that was righteous about Noah? Was it he did such wonderful things? It was he had faith in God. What is it for us? It's the same thing. It is faith through Jesus Christ in God our Creator. Now there's a thing about faith. Real faith is, uh, we're not saved by our works, but real faith does produce works. James chapter 2 verse 26 says this, So as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Real faith produces an action that goes along with it. You know, I think of that time for 120 years in Genesis 6 where God says, okay, I'm going to wipe them out. And some people say, well, if that's your God, I, I don't want anything to do with Him. He's a hateful God. You're not understanding who He is because He gave another 120 years of grace and love for you to find that connection with Him. But God, for that 120 years, as bad as it was, He says there's more sin in the world then than there's ever been. What if one of those men or one of those women outside of Noah's family had just said, you know what? I'm missing something. Would there have been grace for them, even though God had cast judgment upon them? Is there grace for us as we go further and further in our life away from God and those that we may know around us that are lost right now? Is there grace for them no matter what their sin is? Romans chapter 5 verse 20 says, Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The understanding here Paul's saying in the book of Romans is where there is more sin, God even applies more grace. God is such a loving and merciful God. I want us to go New Testament, if you would, for a minute. Go with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. One of many of my favorites. It's such a biblical truth as we look at this. In Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 through 10. It talks about our faith. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. The first three verses are talking about who we were before we found Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. If you can imagine back to Genesis 6, it was all the men and women doing whatever was wicked in the imagination of their heart. This is who we were before we found Jesus. He says, you were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air. That's the devil. Do you see? He's saying even in the New Testament reference to the new churches, you were following all of those carrots that the devil dangled in front of you. We see the same thing happen in Genesis chapter 3. The devil and his followers are to do nothing but to kill, steal, and destroy your heart, your soul, to pull you away from God. They want to deceive you in whatever way to pull you away from the relationship and truth that God wants you to be in with Him. We see the same reference in the New Testament. He says, this is who you were before you found Jesus. He says, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversations in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. That's the life before Christ. And then he says in verse 4, I love but God." He says in verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace we are saved. Notice what's said next. And He's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages of time uh, to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace we're saved, how? Through faith. How was Noah found righteous? It was not through his action. It was through his faith. And that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Do you see 
do you see the stage set in Genesis chapter 3? Sin, judgment, God's grace, and redemption. Genesis chapter 6, there's sin. God's grieved about it. There's judgment that's passed, but there's always God's grace. In the New Testament, we see sin. We see the devil trying to, to just snatch us away from any relationship with God and the truth of His Word through Jesus. Sin enters. Judgment is passed if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Judgment is passed and the judgment day is coming. But there's grace. Grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Do you see that same occurring theme. You know, if we were to look through the book of Romans, and I think I'm going to bring us to a close here. Paul does such a good job of, of laying some things out for us. It's a reminder of what our faith is to be in. Faith in what? What does that mean? He says in Romans 3.10, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. As we look in this chapter, it is to show that there is no one who does good enough to deserve righteousness. He says in 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Go with me to 3 verse 21. He says, but now the righteousness of God without the law. See, the law was given. People would try to follow the law in their works, and that's how they would be righteous. But when you offend the law one time, you are guilty of it all. He says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. It's been created, being witnessed by the law and in the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all of them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It is the gospel message. It is faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 6 verse 23 reminds us as we look at this scripture, the wages of sin. What do, we, what do we earn from our sin? The wages of sin, what you get for your sin is death. But we see the gift of God is eternal life. How? Through faith. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 tells us that if we shall confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, that's openly speak. I'm bold enough to say, I believe in Jesus Christ, and shall believe in that heart. You see that heart coming out again? Because we can profess anything. But he says, no, it's coming from your heart. It's in your heart. And in, in Genesis 6, we see that their heart was full of wicked imaginations. But he says here that if you confess with your mouth a true belief coming out of your heart, he goes on, that God hath raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. How is it we escape that judgment that is promised for all? For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God created, and it was very good. God's own creation rebelled. Sin entered the world. The devil, Scripture tells us, he took a third of the angels with him. Where were they running? They were running all over the earth. God took those that took daughters of men, and he's got them placed away right now. But there's others still running the earth that just want to tempt us and pull us away from the truth and a relationship with God. It's spiritual warfare. It's real, and it's happening today. It's what we battle right now. We see these same examples but even with sin entering the world, judgment comes. We see God's grace. You know, I just want you to see what grace looks like. In the book of Genesis chapter 6, let's look at Noah. It says in verse 8, He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's number one. That's pretty good. Then notice what it says in verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. There's a relationship Noah has with God. We go on in verse 10. He's been blessed in family. It says, And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
All right, as we, we look at this, it continues. It, it talks about the curse that's going on. Verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. So here's Noah that has been found righteous through his faith in the middle of all of this corruption. But then if you'll skip over with me and look at verse 14. God blesses Noah by using him. And as we look 14 through 17, there is instructions where God says, Hey, Noah, I want you to be a part of my plan. Wouldn't it have been a mighty task? I don't know about you. I'd have got tired of building a boat in 120 years. <laughs> and this boat, you know, it wasn't like our boats today. It's just a building that floated. It didn't have a motor. It didn't have a steering wheel. It didn't have a rudder. It was just there. It was this massive building that floated just the way God wanted it to be. But what I want you to see is because Noah had faith in God, he was used by God. Y'all, we're in a world today that is getting closer and closer to the days of Noah. We have mass population. We have sexual perversion. We have those that are following demonic activity. We have wickedness in every way all upon the earth. You have all of these things right now. Will Jesus come back tomorrow, or is it still going to be another 10,000 years? I don't know. I'm not going to be one that tells you when it is, because His Word plainly says, nobody shall know. But I will tell you He gives us signs. And so I want to be ready, because I know judgment's real. It's going to happen. But the wonderful thing about judgment is we are promised through God's grace that if we have faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and our Messiah, that we believe that in our heart, we shall be saved. What a wonderful message we see in the Old Testament. I'm telling you, you can't think up some of the things that are written in Scripture. Amen. I want you to know wherever you are in your life, if you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, but, you know, maybe there's just been times of falling backwards or there's been things in your life, that's, there's been junk that just gets in the way and, you know, your relationship isn't where it is, needs to be, you can, you can do something with that. But, but understand this. God, He wants you to come home. He wants you to be back. But you've not lost your salvation. You know who He is. Don't let the devil make doubt in your mind. You've got to know that you are saved. All of that judgment is going to be real. But, but if our, our name is written in the Lamb's book of life, it is because of our faith in Jesus Christ. But I want to be very, very clear because I love you. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then judgment is coming. And your name's not written in the Lamb's book of life. And there's going to be eternal punishment that comes with it. It's not a scare tactic. I'm telling you this because I love you. I'm not going to be a preacher that says God loves everybody and they're going to heaven because that's not what the Word of God says. But God is a loving God. Just like in the days of Noah where he said judgment is going to come and it had a timetable. He's told us today judgment is coming. Only he knows when. Why isn't he back today? Because he wants all men to have an opportunity to be saved. That's the love, the mercy, and the grace of God. As DJ plays our hymn of decision, whatever it is, we're going to stand sing the first and the last stanza, whatever comes up. I just ask you, is God speaking to you in some way today? Do you just need prayer? Do you need to give your life to the Lord? Do you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Maybe you want to join the church. Maybe you just want to praise the Lord. I don't know. Man, God is good. Amen? Amen? But if He's speaking to you today as we stand and we sing, would you follow what God's called you to do? Let's stand together as we sing.